Okay, this is the Confucius practice test walkthrough. The practice test is actually identical to the real test uh, in that both are pulling the exact from the exact request. They're pulling questions randomly from the same pools of questions. Um, in fact, if you take the practice test enough times, you will wind up act, uh, doing all the questions in the pools. But that'll take a really long time because one of the pools has 20 questions in it or 30 questions in it. it and um, so it's, a, uh, it's pretty heavily randomized. Um, so the only difference between the practice test and the real test is that the real test grade will show up in the grade book. So practice here and then go over to the real test when you, when you feel confident. The other thing is that uh, the practice test is arranged the same way the review sheet is arranged. Let me, let me show you the review sheet for a second. So this is the review sheet. As you can see, it's broken up into sections. There's one on general philosophical terms, one on the historical background, one on Confucius and his disciples, and one on Confucian terms. And then there's actually a separate review sheet where you're supposed to keep, keep notes on those Confucian terms. So the way the test works is that there is a pool of questions that is about this first subject area, a pool of questions that's about the second, a pool of questions that's about the third and the fourth. Um, and then there's a fifth pool of questions that is for passage identification. That's, we'll see that later. That's the one where I'm showing you a passage and it may or may not be real Confucius. Um, and that sort of covers, if that synthesizes everything that we're talking about. So uh, um, one of the things that happened and one of the reasons why there was a delay in posting the test is uh, I realized that the, the uh, test question banks and the review sheet were a little bit out of alignment. So there are two items on the review sheet that weren't there before. I want you to note them. One is Confucius's attitude towards his era and Confucius's description of himself. So I, uh, I re-uploaded this sheet with those on it. You should probably go back and take notes um, using this review sheet so you can prepare for the test. Remember the test is open book and open note. So um, if you've got good notes, you should be able to fill in all of this information. So just as a demonstration, I quickly started to fill in some basics inform information on a copy of the review sheet here. The stuff I was filling in, in was in red. You might want to take longer notes than this, but the main thing that I do here uh, that I recommend doing is tying things back to parts of the presentation when you're talking about parts of the presentation, right? So um, the notion of argument is defined in video three, slide seven, and video three in general covers a lot of the basic terminology around argument and critical thinking that we are using in this course. Um, also, you might want to make notes about the text itself. So for the one of the items I added, Confucius's attitude towards his era, I have this general note, right? Conf the Zhou dynasty was the golden age, um, and his era was, uh, in his mind, a corrupt and fallen era because people were no longer following the ways of the, the great Zhou dynasty. And I talk about that in video two, slide four. And it's also talked about in the introduction of, uh, of your text in this section called the age of Confucius, right? Okay, so let's take a look at the text test itself. So the first two questions deal with this, uh, the pool that's about general philosophical terms. And that pool is actually going to be in all uh, three tests. So you, these questions could appear, will, will appear in this test, in the Plato test, and in the test on the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, um, so let's just take a look at this. Um, a lot of these are critical thinking terms, terms about argument, because one of the things that I've emphasized is that in philosophy we present um, almost all of our ideas almost all of the time in the form of arguments, premises, and conclusions. 
So uh, we define an argument as uh, a series of statements, sequence of statements, whatever, statements um, designed to provide evidence for another statement called the conclusion, right? Um, let's say connected. Connected series of statements. And we'll spell connected correctly, right? And this comes up actually in, I discussed this in the video on mentious and argument, right? So this is the relevant slide here. I say that uh, I define an argument as a connected series of statements designed to convince an audience of another statement. Um, and this is in the Mencius slide because in the Chinese philosophical tradition, it's really with Mencius, um, who was a, a, a later generation follower of Confucius, that the idea of argument becomes central to Confucian philosophy. Um, so it's, um, so yeah, that's all discussed here. The other question in the practice test um, that's about argument is a question that asks you to put an argument in standard form, right? One of the things I did uh, for a lot of, uh, in the Mencius video is I took the arguments that Mencius presents and I put them in standard form with premises and conclusion marked. So for question two, you're going to get a random passage um, and uh, you're going to have to put the argument that the person in the passage is giving in standard form. What that means is that you're going to list premises and conclusions. So your premises are just going to be P1, P2, and your conclusion will be C. Um, and generally there will be between one and three premises. So let's read this passage. Cindy is predicting that spring break will go well. She thinks to herself, if the car breaks down on the way to Florida, that would ruin our vacation. But the car isn't going to break down. Therefore, our vacation will not be ruined. So we want to look at the part that's in quotes because that's the argument that Cindy is giving. Um, and then we uh, want to look for indicator words. This word here, therefore, is an indicator word. It lets you know that uh, what follows is the conclusion of an argument. So we're going to say, and we can just cut and paste here. It makes our life simpler. Um, our vacation will not be ruined. If the car breaks down on the way to Florida, that would ruin our vacation. Um, and then, but the car isn't going to break down. And we'll just paraphrase that here. But the car isn't going to break down. And our indicator word is therefore. Just as an aside, you should note that this is a bad argument um, because there are other things that could ruin their vacation besides the car breaking down. All right, next two questions are about the historical background. And this one, the first one just asks you to put, put the dynasties in chronological order. So in the second video, A Taste of Confucius, I give you some background on the dynasties that are immediately around Confucius's time. A full chronology is given in the text. Oh, where is it? Teach me to use bookmarks. Right here um, on page uh, Roman numeral 23, but this is the full chronology of like all of China. And so I just ask you to learn the stuff between the Shang and uh, the, the Han dynasties. So that's just a couple pages in here. So you need to know the order. And basically the idea is, oh, this isn't the order. I should read the question. It says match the, um, the dynasties with statements that are true about them. Okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, let's just look at this. So Eastern Zhou. Um, 
This is the time that Confucius lived. So the Zhou is the golden era that Confucius looked back on. Um, and, uh, oh, I don't have that as an option. But the Zhou is uh, the, t the period of time when uh, worship of Shangdi was replaced by worship of Tian, right? And that establishes sort of the standardized religion and set of concepts that Confucius looked back on as um, uh, the really how everyone should behave. The Shang is the oldest dynasty. Um, and during that, the god that was worshipped was Shangdi, God on High. Qin are the first dynasty to unite all of China. Um, and uh, the first dynasty to ban, the first dynasty actually banned Confucius's writings in favor of legalist writings. I talk about that in the video on two alternate schools to Confucianism. And then Han sort of gives us the end of the story. This is when Confucianism becomes the state religion. That is, so you start to see um, the empire have tests, standardized tests on um, Confucius's thought. Um, and if you do well in the test, you have a chance of getting a job in the government, which is a really prestigious thing. Okay, Qin Dynasty. Um, it is generally considered the first empire to unite all of China. Yes. It's also where we get our name, China. It's um, from Qin. Um, it introduced standardized writing, money, and units of measurement. Yes. It was a time of big infrastructure projects. Yes. So the Qin Emperor, this was like 15, only 15 years long, but he united everything and completely remade all of China in the image that he wanted. Um, this is not when uh, the Confucian tests were established. He uses legalist, um, f a legalist framework, nor is it the, the time work when the ideas of Confucianism were developed. That was Those were developed during the Zhou Empire, which is his... Um, uh, the, uh, uh, which was the Golden Age. So we've got now two questions on Men on Confucius's student. Uh, one is Mencius, uh, students, and so one is Mencius. Mencius was uh, not an immediate follower of Confucius. He was taught, you might remember Master Zhang in the book, um, Master Zhang's grandson taught Confucius, or taught Mencius. Um, and he gave us that bit of the reading um, where, uh, that we had, that little reading that we had where he argues that all people have a heart that cannot stand to see, see the suffering of others. And as I, as I was just saying, He's the first to really introduce the notion of argument into and cent, make central the idea of argument in the Confucian tradition. The other student that we get from our randomized thing is Yan Wei, uh, who is uh, was Confucius's favorite pupil, but who died young. Right. Um, so it's these ones. So the other students, the only false one here is the first one. Uh, it says the other students resented the favorable treatment he received from the master. Uh, you might remember in the book, that's not true. In fact, Zigong says, God, Yan Wei, he is so good. Um, I believe the line is, he learns what, he is taught one thing and thereby knows 10, whereas I'm taught one thing and I only know two. Right, so even the other students were impressed with Yan Wei, but he died young, and that really affected the master um, uh, profoundly. He was really uh, upset. Oh, and I selected a wrong one here. I need to read rather than just talking. He impressed the master by always asking insightful questions. No, he did not. Um, in fact, the master said, gosh, he seems stupid. He never asks me any questions. But when things turn around and you see him in practice, um, uh, Yan Wei in practice, you see that he actually understands everything because he can do it right. So that's that one. 
All right. I'm going to role model reading the questions carefully now. So, which of the following are true about the Confucian concept of learning? So, uh, the last question pool on the review sheet is about the um, central Confucian concepts. You should have a running sheet where you were keeping track of analects that are relevant to this. Um, and uh, there's some, uh, well, so uh, the one that we got pulled this time is learning. So what do we want to say? Learning is not important for a gentleman. Now that's false. Obviously learning is important, incredibly important for a gentleman. Learning moderates the other vices. Yeah, there's a passage about that. He where he says, um, you know, if you love uh, righteousness but not learning, you will become too rigid, um, right? And he also talks, so, um, right? Um, learning doesn't require any books or teachers. No, no. The learning he's talking about is very much book learning. It is tied to the reading of the Confucian classics like the Book of Odes and the Book of Documents. Learning gives words. If you do not study, you lack the means to speak. Learning is tied to practice. You have to, uh, you know you have learned when you can act. And that's a central point, right? Um, acting is um, um, the sign of knowledge for Confucius. 40 to 60 words on Wu Wei. Okay. Wu Wei, I'm not going to include the accents here. Literally, W E I means not acting, but it is more of a sort of effortless, natural action. Um, a sage, uh, an accomplished person, just spontaneously does the excellent thing. Um, uh, because they are in tune with the Tao. Right? Um, so, do I have 40 words yet? Uh, well, I'll keep going. This notion was radicalized by the Taoists and became the central idea of their school. Um, here, let's see how many words that is. And here I can just pop this into a um, word processor and it tells me I've got 43 words here. All right, so the last two are passage identification role model reading the instructions carefully. Nine through ten are real passage are, are some of passages nine through ten are real passages from Confucius's Analects, either parts that we have read or parts that are not included in your text, and others are decoys. Um, passages from philosophers that I've rewritten to superficially resemble Confucius or stuff that I just made up. So the decoys all have the form the master said and then there's a quote there, but it's not actually something the master said. It might be something that someone else said, maybe one of the Taoists. Um, it may be a completely irrelevant thing or a completely random different thing like a Greek philosopher. Um, and sometimes they, uh, what I've done is I've taken something that Confucius said and turned it on its head. Um, and that would be another kind of decoy that's in there. Um, so you, you need to explain whether you think it's Confucius or a decoy and give reasons for your answers. Um, and most of your grade is actually going to be based on the reasons you give. Um, that is, you should be able to identify what key Confucian themes 
are being expressed or not expressed here. And that is, that's the real sign of knowledge. Um, like Confucius, I'm assuming you can, uh, that the sign of knowledge is practice. In this case, the practice is identifying passages. Okay, it's not quite the same as real world practice, which is what Confucius would really like, but it's closer. So the master said, the gentleman is true, but not rigidly trustworthy. Ooh, that's a hard one. That's actually one of the harder ones in the question pool. Um, so you might think, of course this can't be right. The, a gentleman would be completely trustworthy. You would always say the right thing all the time. But if you think about it, we all know that there are times in which the gentlemanly thing to do is not tell the truth. Um, and generally, when I teach truth-telling, uh, I ask, right, is it, or should you always tell the truth? And someone gives the example of, someone raises their hand and says, no, you shouldn't always tell the truth. Sometimes someone will say, does this dress make me look fat? And you just say no. I don't know why this is everyone's go-to example, but that's the one that people give. And Confucius would say something like that as well. Right. That is, um, there are times in which a gentleman um, might fudge the truth. So this is Confucius. Oh, I got a word count on this one. That's good. This is Confucius. Um, you can tell because he emphasizes flexibility. Um, all of the virtues in Confucius um, even telling the truth are um, are a matter of context are based on context and circumstances um, so I got 23 words I'll do this you don't want to be like Zi Gong, who was too rigid, right? Zi Gong was the Confucian pupil who um, uh, was a negative example because he was too rigid. What's my next one? The master said, speaking with understanding, they must hold fast to what is shared by all as a city holds on to its law and even more firmly because uh, it's the human laws are nurtured by the divine one. It prevails as it will and suffices uh, for all, and this is more than enough. All right, this is another hard one, um, because again, this looks like it might be Confucius. Um, uh, so, uh, because it, it looks like Confucius, because you see that he, the human world parallels the divine world. Right, um, and a well-ordered state in this pa for Confucius, a well-ordered empire matches exactly the empire of heaven, right? So that looks right. the The trick is that Confucius isn't a big fan of law. He believes that you, the ideal ruler rules through personal virtue rather than rigidly following the laws. The idea of rigidly following law is from the legalist school, the rival school, right? Um, so this might be a legalist passage. In fact, it's a Greek passage, a philosopher from a Greek, a passage from a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus. But in any case, you would recognize it as not being Confucian because it uses law to organize the state properly rather than what's really important for Confucius, which is individual virtue, which can't be captured in law. So let's do it like this. This is not Confucius. It looks like Confucius because it says the uh, human order is um, nurtured by the divine order. Always 
affect your spelling. If it, gives, if it gives you the red underline and you don't change it, that just looks bad. Okay, um, human order is nurtured by the divine order, assuming that the red underline is, is correct and not an error. Um, but in this passage, the uh, order is based on law, but for Confucius, law does not capture the Tao. Capitalized Tao. This looks like it might be a legalist philosopher. And I, I got to tell you, if you said that this was Confucius, um, and you said it is Confucius because um, it says the human order is nurtured by the divine order, I'd give you eight out of ten points. I would dock you two points for not noticing the, the law bit, but you know you did capture something really important that the human order is based on the divine order. Okay, so that's the practice test. I encourage you to take it as many times as you want before you take the actual test. Uh, when you take the actual test, all of the questions that uh, require essay responses, like these last ones, are not graded automatically, which means that the grade that you see will be lower than the grade you're actually going to get because it doesn't include, at the very least, these last two questions. Those are ones that I have to go in and check by hand. And then I also check the multiple choice questions um, because I don't like the algorithm it uses to assign partial credit and I give partial credit my own way, um, which is better. Um, so yeah, that's the practice test. If you have any questions, you can uh, just email me or text me.